I would probably pull seven out of ten people randomly in a grocery store and I'd say, what define a horror film? And they would probably talk about a slasher film or the Saw franchise. Absentia is different because it, it really is a psychological character study. It's character driven. It's not about cheap scares. It's about tackling demons in your own life and real ones that might be lurking in a tunnel. <laughs> it's sleeping. I hope an audience takes away that delicious fear uh, that you feel in your gut when you look into a dark room and don't want to walk in and know you have to. It's an unnatural experience making a film, and you have to make it seem like it's completely natural. I think Absentia is an extremely special case that really could have gone wrong in any myriad of ways and didn't. It was a project that we were going to like play around with and um, hope in the end it would at least play the festival circuit. And by the end, it was like we were all trying to make something that could go up against sort of any other horror movie out there. I know how that sounds. You see your eyes? We're going to need to question you a lot more. I swear to you, I could hear him in the walls. <laughs> Absentia is about two sisters who are reunited uh, kind of in the wake of a family tragedy. God, it's really good to see you. It's really good to see you. Trisha's husband has been missing for seven years, and she's getting ready to, to declare him dead, uh, and her sister comes to sort of help her through that process. And they're both coming from very different places. Callie uh, is recovering from drugs, and Trisha is pregnant. Just as Penn's coming to paper, uh, on the application for his death certificate. Trisha is being haunted by visions of her missing husband. Danny? Uh, and also at the same time, Callie, her sister, starts to experience some weird happenings around the neighborhood, especially, specifically, uh, where it comes to a tunnel right across the street. Things really come to a head as uh, the missing husband returns, and shows up back in the scene and it becomes clear that whatever that force is that, that had him uh, might want him back. I like to say that Callie is everything that I'm not. She's just like this free spirit, kind of a bad girl, but really not. I think she ultimately just wants to be good. And, um, and you really see that in the love she has for her sister. Trisha, her husband went missing seven years ago. She's never been able to understand what happened to him. There are people who have watched this movie and think that she is not ready to move on yet. And I would disagree with that. I think that at the start of this movie, that is what she's doing. Obviously, she's started a relationship with the detective. She's pregnant. My character is Detective Ryan Mallory. He is a missing persons detective who has found himself having an incredibly personal experience with it in a, a very professional case. I do not love that you were here tonight for this. I know. Detective Lonergan. I think originally in the first, the, in the treatment of absentia, he didn't exist, but he became this, this partner for Mallory, who had a history of drug addiction, um, which is why he's a compulsive gum chewer. Um, could figure out what Callie was up to because he's been there. You'd like to talk to Daniel again? Daniel. Uh, he is emotionally and physically traumatized to the point of being hardly recognizable. And uh, suddenly the sisters are forced to deal with this uh, in such a way, you know, they're no longer able to move on with their lives like they thought they were going to do. It really has a, a great deal of attention paid to character, and that's something that that really um, impressed me from the original read of it. It was trying to create the characters and have this um, or storyline kind of organically work around them. And it just so happens that that storyline is a horror movie. Absentia is a horror movie that doesn't really reveal too much and I think that is what makes it scary. Um, Mike Flanagan is the kind of director that uh, I think trusts his audience and um, how intelligent they are and leaves a lot to their imagination. So many horror films today fall back on torture or uh, sadism 
um, and violence and, and kind of over-the-top gore uh, to, to make their point. And I think there's, there's absolutely a market for that, and I, I enjoy my share of them too. But for me, what makes this movie different is that it's decidedly minimal. There's no gore, very little gore. It's, it's, it, the fear comes from you, from uh, your own imagination as the, as the viewer. It kind of falls back on the idea that what you can't see is, is going to be scarier than, than what you can. It really is a psychological character study um, with really extremely well fleshed out characters in realistic situations um, having to deal with extraordinary circumstances. And in this case, the extraordinary circumstance is a supernatural element that is beyond their control. I lived across the street from this tunnel for years and, and thought it was creepy and, and deserved, could, you know, it could be a great backdrop for a horror film. I didn't know what that film was. Uh, I, had, I had access to some really talented friends that were actors that were also out here in LA struggling and trying to find a foothold in the industry. When Mike first had the idea to, you know, let's make a little movie that'll just be sort of us and a camera that we owned and um, we thought it was going to be a little side project. We thought it was going to be maybe some fun scenes for each of us to add to our actor reels. We had been hanging out and always wanted to make a movie together and originally the idea was just that we would um, have a summer of movie making. I'd, I'd done three indie features as a director and a writer uh, before and never been able to find a market for them. Um, they were character dramas and, and while they were great learning experiences, I, I was never able to sell them and kind of move on to the next level. So this initially was meant to be, frankly, uh, a way to create a calling card. The original idea was just to get you know, a group of friends together on weekends with uh, cameras that we can you know, find around the house, so to speak, uh, and, just, um, and just sort of play around and, and, and see what comes about. So it became more about trying to find a story that wouldn't cost us much money to make, um, that would utilize ingredients that were already on hand, uh, the location, the actors, and then it became about trying to find a story that, that we could actually feasibly do. So it was completely backwards. Um, it was actually my younger brother who appears in the film as Jamie Lambert. Um, when I, I pitched this to him on the phone, it was just like, I, I have a camera, I have a group of talented actors, and I have this tunnel, but I don't have a story that first threw out the idea of the Billy Goat's Gruff. And that story of three goats who encounter a troll underneath a bridge uh, suddenly became the template for three people who encounter something sinister uh, in a tunnel. Morgan Peter Brown um, approached me with an idea to start a like little independent film company back in fall of 2009. And, um, you know, basically he wanted to have an engine for us as actors to find and develop creative projects with people that we wanted to work with. At the same time, I've, I've been friends with Courtney Bell and with Mike Flanagan uh, for a little while and um, was pitched uh, the movie by Mike as, as something to do for our fledgling production company to do first, a small project. Casting the movie was, was actually very easy um, because the the uh, majority of the, the roles were cast before it was written. I am in a relationship with Courtney Bell. Uh, Katie Parker has had been hanging out with us uh, kind of constantly, and we have this kind of sibling relationship with her. And Dave Levine, I've known for many years, and, and uh, so it was kind of kind of backwards again because I knew who I wanted to cast and work with before I knew what characters they'd play. But it, it put me in the position where I could actually write to them. And, and having, having uh, the knowledge of them that I did, I could write to what I thought were their strengths. He called me up one day and said, hey, you want to be in my film? And I was like, yeah, sure, uh, I'd love to. And I, I kind of gave it like the sort of dismissive quality, but you know, it turned out it was a great experience and, and it, it grew from there. I, <laughs> I have to admit, I was like incredibly skeptical about this film. I would talk to Mike about um, how I was like, are you sure? Like, we're gonna, are you sure we're gonna make this movie? Are you sure the movie's gonna get done? Are you sure you're gonna have time to edit it? Are you sure people are gonna wanna see it? Are you sure it's good? It was not ever gonna be anything really big. 
at first. And then in February of 2010, we discovered that I was pregnant. Um, and so we had been planning on shooting over the summer and we realized that we were gonna have a, a little uh, a bump there to work with. We had had kind of a hard deadline as to when we had to start the shoot uh, simply because of Courtney's pregnancy. We wanted to time it in such a way that she would be visibly pregnant but you know still be physically able to do all that she was able to do. And what that immediately did to the story was add so much emotional complexity to what's been going on with, with everyone involved in the story. Um, it's of course very obviously very complex for, for Trisha. It, it adds so much more for Detective Mallory do you need anything for the, uh... I'm fine. We're fine. For Daniel to come home and see that his wife is moved on. It gave us so many more levels to play with. No. One of the first things that, that changed the game for this was a conversation with Rustin Cervini. I was planning on shooting the film on, on this JVC camera that I, I had bought for a documentary project, and, and Rustin was the first one to, to pitch me on the idea of shooting on uh, DSLRs, uh, specifically the Canon 5D. The 5D Mark II just shoots incredible uh, images in low light, and I mean, they use them on so many film sets uh, these days uh, just for the extra f scenes that they can't get a big camera in there, and uh, it's just amazing what they can do. I initially was very, uh, very skeptical of it. It looks like a still camera. It doesn't look like a, a camera you make a movie with. And then we decided to do a, uh, to do a test shoot, a camera test, to just kind of see what it could do. From what I understood, it's going to be Mike and me, and we're going to basically get maybe uh, Katie Parker to come over, and maybe use Courtney, and we'll just test it out, just see what it looks like. As the week progresses, all of a sudden it turns into this whole idea that we're going to shoot basically a trailer for the film, which there is no screenplay yet for. I need you to tell me where you've been. We used it as a way to try to drum up support for the project and maybe even find some funds. And that was the first time I looked at it and said, well, actually, this thing could look like a real movie. This could look really good. You imagined it. I saw it. And uh, that took us up to another level right away. I wish I didn't know. Something's moving in the tunnel. How easy it is. It's not real. To be yanked out of this world. It's in the house. And that kind of set off this eureka moment. And I, I went off and, and dove into it. And the script happened very fast. Uh, the script writing process, I know, was insane. I was, I was getting pages emailed to me from Mike in, in 20 page chunks along one evening, like every three hours, I believe. It was like another 20 pages. I'm still surprised at how fast it happened. I would never want to work that way again. But it just kind of fell together. I was like, well, we need to find money. How do we find money? We've never made a movie. Nobody knows who the hell we are. Hey, give us money. It's kind of a tough question to ask. It's always a tough question to ask, but especially when you have no clout behind you. So one morning I, uh, I checked Twitter and the author Neil Gaiman, who I follow on Twitter, mentioned that he was supporting a film on this website called Kickstarter. Justin Gordon was the first one to really kind of bring up Kickstarter as, a, as, a, as an option for fundraising and I was really against it initially. I didn't know anything about the site. It was a, basically a social networking crowdfunding platform where you could go in and support a project um, you know, you could donate as little as $5 all the way up to $10,000. I saw that it was working. There were projects that were being funded. We decided to give it a shot. Um, kind of much like everything else involved in this project, it took on a life of its own. You have to set a monetary goal and a timeline with which you'll, you'll achieve that goal. If you do not achieve that goal in the timeline, you don't get to keep any of the money that people donate. The people don't get charged for donating. It just kind of is a wash. We set our initial fundraising goal at $15,000, uh, which is what we thought at the time we could make the movie for. <laughs> um, yeah, right. I don't think anyone expected to have to dive in so hard to the, the Kickstarter thing. It was a month of full-time work and pounding the pavement. What we did was we made 
public service announcement style videos where uh, key members of the cast and crew would, would get, get on a, a screen and, and say, please help us donate at least $5 if you can. For the first two people who contribute $350 or more, we're offering a walk-on role in the film Absentia. Uh, we made these, these videos every couple of days to try to encourage people to, to donate to the project. I'm about to join the elite sorority of horror heroines. So I want to do everything I can from now until when the film is released to make myself synonymous with heroin. That was actually a lot of fun and it was um, really surprising. I don't think any of us thought that it would be the kind of phenomenon that it came to be. It's not like the director hates me or anything. <laughs> Action! I wish I didn't know how easy it was. Go on, And they started donating. And we just started making a ton of money. And it was, it was, it was shock. No one, I think no one thought it was going to work. It's the first time I've ever gotten to play a cop, which I've always wanted to do. The next thing we knew towards like the last week of the Kickstarter campaign, we suddenly shot above, far above $15,000. We've actually already met our initial goal of $15,000 thanks to people like you. It was like $17,000 and then $20,000 and then... I'm Mark Wahlberg from The Departed. We ended up with over 23000 It was awesome. And with the extra money we've raised on Kickstarter, we'll be able to afford things like a professional makeup artist and some really terrific exterior locations. And special effects. Yeah! Yeah! There's two of me. So we did that, um, all the while still trying to find private investment to get the rest of the capital to, to you know, finish up the film. The big game changer for us there was the addition of Doug Jones. Saying yes to a movie is always um, a three-step process. Read the script. Is it a story that I want to help tell? Is the character somebody that I want to portray? Is it someone I connect with? And number three is the director. Whose hands am I going to be in? Am I, am I safe? Is, is his storytelling ability something that, that, that connects with me? My, my uh, coffee date with, with Mike Flanagan turned into three hours plus, and, uh, and uh, the you know, coffee be gone, and we're still sitting there, blah, 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 blah. And uh, so that kind of connection is somebody you want to keep in your life. So, uh, so the, the, doing this movie was a no-brainer. Now I want to do all of his movies. And that, again, suddenly just added a lot of pressure uh, for us to, to be professional enough um, to, to earn his presence. Absentia, set, day one. Oh, I know, it sounds just so... I know, uh, Yeah. I, I mean, I, I knew there was going to be paperwork. I just didn't realize <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, big time. The shoot was 15 days uh, from middle, mid to late June to early July. The first week, the first six days, were all night shoots. It's late at night here on the set of Absentia. Sound crew's gone home, and this is when things start to get interesting. Oh, hey guys! <laughs> Nothing's going on here. Hey, Drew. <laughs> Welcome to Absentia After Hours. We shot in my apartment, which I never would like to do again. Um, we had a very small crew. I, I think our skeleton crew was eight people. But we had everything just shoved into this, into this, this four-room space. The costumes and the equipment and the crew just kind of all piled on top of each other in these tiny spaces that had to be rotated and moved depending on what room we were shooting in. I was six months pregnant and for two weeks of having, you know, 15 to 20 people in my space, it was definitely a little claustrophobic and exacerbated by the hormones of being pregnant. Um, there were times when it was very exhausting and very frustrating. Um, now, my character Trisha is exhausted and sort of at the end of her tether for a lot of the movie and so it was actually very helpful for me as an actor. We all wore different hats on on the production uh, you know I was I was a producer, I was locations, I was even craft services I just kind of did whatever you know it took to you know make make the shoot run smoothly. We didn't have a first AC to help full focus, we didn't have a gaffer you know to have the camera department be one person it's definitely a challenge, for sure. Everyone's doing multiple jobs. I definitely held the boom mic a few times, um, you know, but, the, but the actual shoot itself was um, a race against time. Most scenes, from what I can remember, you know, we only had, did them in two or three takes, you know, for the most part. There were some that went on a little longer. Um, but yeah, it was frenetic. 
there were days we did, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, there were days we did more than 50 setups in a single day and, and uh, only had time for a take at most. We didn't have lights. Was the other beauty of the, the only way this, this shoot would have ever been successful is the camera was so forgiving of available light and could make it look so good um, that we very rarely built lights at all. I think maybe once or twice the entire time. And that's the only thing that made it possible for us to do this. As opposed to coming up with a, a setup, lighting it, rehearsing it, doing a few takes, seeing if you had it moving on, pointing at something, camera jumping in, no lights, no prep, no rehearsal, two takes at the most, and then moving on. It was a, it was a marathon. Katie, after your first two scenes, first two sequences of yeah. the first scene, how are you feeling? Um, good. It, you know, it's like, you, it takes a, a few takes to kind of get into it. And, right. Um, and you're wearing very restrictive clothing. <laughs> this is the worst costume I've ever had. <laughs> so and then as we started to, to shoot, things would become more difficult. And I think it became increasingly difficult um, because we were fighting time. And um, yeah, fighting the sun, <laughs> fighting our budget. Everyone was kind of getting cranky. That was like towards the end of the first week because we had one week of night shoots and one week of day shoots. Some of us were sleeping on the floor. You just get worn out. We've been cooped up in this apartment for, you know, what seemed like months, but it was only about seven days. And he's out, he's up, he's out, he's up. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Okay. And it was time to sort of explore the tunnel and, uh, you know, invite Doug Jones to be a part of the cast. Doug Jones Day was something that we had built up since pre-production once we figured out that he was coming in and we had kind of come up with the schedule. We had, you know, Doug Jones's role. We were going to shoot him out in one day. He had two scenes that we had to do. Um, and it was kind of, it was definitely our biggest day. Most movie shoots I've done don't have a Doug Jones day. Uh, uh, but walking into this, I was like, it's Doug Jones day. And everybody was, was acting very like, oh, Doug Jones is here. You don't always get that on a movie set, so that was I, I, the respect was was beyond what I deserved. Uh, so I felt very uh, humbled and um, embarrassed almost that we were having a Doug Jones Day. Everything was bigger on Doug Jones Day. We had better food. We had more people on the set to help out than we ever had before, and everybody really came together in a really, you know gung-ho kind of way. Most of the cast, this was almost everyone's first in, uh, first feature film. So that energy and that excitement, that bright-eyed, you know, hopefulness for their, their own future, and this is so, we're so excited to be, we're making a movie! That's an energy that I don't often get on the big studio lots. So th this, that was ex exceptional for me. Originally, I just thought it was going to be so much pressure because we had, you know, the guy from Penn's Labyrinth and the Silver Surfer was going to be in our little movie shoot. And uh, <laughs> I think every, everybody on set was like, we have to behave and we have to do everything right. <laughs> Walking into that tunnel the first time, it was like, oh, it's getting darker and smellier in here. <laughs> but. I was also impressed with the fact that, um, that there was no lighting set up from the crew. It was, we were using the lighting that was in that tunnel. We didn't use any lights in that tunnel in day or night. It was all lit with what was there. So it was kind of like, oh dear, I hope this comes off. Wow. You know, you're gonna, this is your spot you're going to lie down on, Doug, right here. Uh, so, and it was a patch that had been scrubbed clean and disinfected. <laughs> <laughs> Shooting the scene with him and Katie in the tunnel, I was really intimidated about having to step up and actually be able to direct them. Um, so I, I decided to handle that by covering the hell out of the scene. Oh, fuck me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have anything. You see me? The rest of the cast was talking about how they got it, got everything in one or two takes, and I'm thinking, well, we did like 48 takes of every angle, and we did like 60 angles <laughs> on on me while we were in the tunnel. I, I mean, we we shot more than 20 setups, and each one had four or five takes, which makes it just it is the most covered scene in the movie, and you can feel it as you watch it. Suddenly, the camera's cutting to a brand new angle every second for for the 90 seconds that he's on there, uh, which I think works, but um, th that is certainly, if you ever want to see a, a director's insecurity manifest physically in a film, that's it. 
every imaginable uh, angle and close up, medium, wide, all that. So keeping the performance consistent through that much, uh, you know, was was that was the challenge for me. And so, so having James Flanagan there uh, to close by to remind me of the father-son relationship, what helped was that between every, every shot, uh, I asked Jamie uh, uh, if he would come up and, and just give me a hug. <laughs> so he did, and we sat there, and then uh, the release of that and him walking away gave me the separation that I needed to want that back. Every single take, he was spot on. Anything that Mike asked him to do, he would do. He was really professional, and I think uh, he sort of um, elevated everyone's performance levels. It was like nice to work with somebody who was just like he just kind of knew what he was doing. And uh, you know, it was just it was kind of a special day. We, you know, we had about 20 extras. Um, you know, we were actually outside at the tunnel, you know, across the street, and you know, the movie kind of took took shape that day. I thought, you know, it sort of stretched out the production value of it grew and it grew in scope and it started to really feel like something significant. Ah, hold them back, hold them back, ah, hold them back. Ah, sorry, ah, oh, you're gonna have to stand still. Hold them back, hold them back. Hold them back. The hardest moment of a production for me was uh, our second day at Silver Dream Studios shooting the, the police uh, scenes. I showed up a little bit late to set that day because, you know, woke up not feeling 100%, Gideon had been up the whole night before throwing up. My, my son Gideon, it, he was a little less than two years old at the time. Our director of photography, Rustin, was very sick and exhausted and basically uh, worked diligently up until the point that he physically collapsed holding the camera in the middle of a take, uh, which was amazing because he was able to hold it up as he fell so that someone could catch it, which I've always been amazed by. But we were on a soundstage. We couldn't afford to come back another day. Uh, we were burning money and we had no other option. And I had to pick up the camera um, and just shoot the rest of the day, which was terrifying because I didn't know how to use the camera. Uh, Mike had to take over the, the director of photography. Um, responsibilities and uh, it was that was I think everybody's hair pulling out day. I don't remember much of the day I remember it just being terrifying and uh, luckily the footage was passable enough to to survive because I think I don't know how we would have been able to go back and pick that up I don't think we ever would have been able to afford to um, so that that was just a it, it's another example of us really lucking out but that for me was kind of the, the nightmare scenario Post-production on the film was really, um, it was fast. Uh, I think the, the first cut of the movie was 95 minutes and the, and the, the picture lock cut was 91 minutes. Um, it was very lean, there really wasn't much to remove. Post was a shock, it was like, oh, right, we do have to pay for a, a sound mix, we do have to pay for color correction, you know, we have to pay to submit to festivals. It's like, it's a whole other world. It's, um, you know, and I, I, I admit that I sound horribly naive right now. Um, because I was. <laughs> As I'm watching the film come together, suddenly it's like this movie is, is, is bigger than I ever thought it was going to be. As the quality of the film became more and more evident, and, and as, as the film was get, garnering these fantastic reactions, it was an extremely exciting experience, and, and all of it, it was all very new. somehow miraculously it all worked out and, and that's kind of the thing I take away from the whole experience of Absentia was that we lucked the hell out again and again and again. I think Absentia really kind of got the ball rolling for me in my acting career and um, taught me a lot about filmmaking and, um, and I got to do it with people who I love and respect and admire and aspire to be and work with again and um, it was a really 
positive and enriching experience for me. I will remember the experience of making this movie as one of intense insanity that is incredibly wonderful. And it was such a small, intimate cast and crew that are like family now. And they're like Rigby's family, too. Three months later, when Rigby was born, it was, you know, everyone descended upon us all again. I feel incredibly bonded with everyone, you know, every cast member, every crew member that we worked with. And in the years to come, we'll all be able to look back and remember Absentia as something that sent us off into a new level. For me, I'm a, I'm a part-time actor at, at this stage of my career. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a server at a restaurant. So the idea of spending 15 days straight coming in to do a movie just seemed awesome to me. We all bonded over this 15 day experience that wasn't always easy and wasn't always happy and fun, but these people are, are, my, are my own. I consider them my family. For me, it was you know, my first time producing, so it was kind of a crash course um, in the business side of filmmaking. On the other side, I really feel that we set out to make a different, exciting, thought-provoking, intelligent horror movie, and I feel we did that. In a lot of ways, it was smoother than we could have ever imagined. Uh, it's only now when we look back that was like, that was kind of crazy. That whole spirit of, you know, we're going to pull our friends together and we're going to make something happen, um, it reminds people like me that are, you know, have been in the business for 25 years. It reminds us why we started in this business in the first place, you know, that it was the love of the art. I remember Absentia as a movie that was that was thought of thought up by friends and then in the end it was created by professionals. This film has exceeded everyone's expectation for what it was going to be. Best narrative feature Absentia. Yeah. I feel like I should club someone with this. This is amazing. I mean, the fact that, that you're watching this DVD right now in your house uh, of this film was, was something that, at the time we were shooting it, was kind of pie in the sky. That it's changed so much um, is, is a testament, I think, to, to, the, to the people involved and also to luck um, and to, uh, to improvisation. Because everybody, at some point, had to completely jump in uh, and do something that they had no idea how to do in order to keep the movie moving uh, forward.